Thank you guys for coming. Um, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Nathan Fox. I'm chair of the MFA Visual Narrative Program here at the School of Visual Arts. Uh, the MFA VN program is basically a, a relatively unique approach to visual storytelling as both author and artist. So we place equal emphasis on creative writing as well as visual development and visual expression in all forms and mediums. Uh, comics, film, screenwriting, script writing, uh, you know, cartoons, animation, you name it. Uh, I also happen to uh, be the director uh, and co-founder of the Rezo Lab uh, upstairs, uh, of which we currently have workshops and CE classes open. Uh, so anybody who's interested, uh, please feel free to let us know. Uh, the Rezo Lab is an all educational uh, Rezo Lab that's dedicated to self-publishing and the empowerment of authorship in printed matter. Uh, that said, much like our program, it's interdisciplinary and we've had the machines and everything used from paper sculptures to zines uh, to flyers and beyond. So uh, if any of that's of interest, uh, please let me know. Uh, and uh, about three months ago, I think, uh, I happen to, or we happen to be fortunate enough to have a faculty, uh, Bill Cardalopoulos, uh, an amazing critic and writer uh, and author, uh, who teaches for us in the history of storytelling, who let me know about uh, the Gotha Institute and Walter Schleck. Uh, so it was great to have an introduction, and I'm very excited for this partnership, for the conversation tonight uh, with Nora Krug and Lena Hoven. Uh, so, without further delay, I guess I'd like to welcome up uh, Walter to say a few words and we'll get started. Thank you, Nathan. Um, the, uh, I'm a librarian, at the, I'm Walter Schlecht, a librarian at the Goethe Institute. We're a cultural institute and a language school, and our New York location is on 30 Irving Place, just east of Union Square. I encourage all of you to come by in our library. We have a very large collection of German graphic novels and comics. And we also do a number of events there related to German film, German literature, and a number of other things. Um, but uh, tonight, I'd like to introduce Lena Hoven, um, one of the artists we're lucky to have here tonight. She was born in 1977, lives and works as a freelance illustrator and comic artist. Uh, her graphic novel, Liebe schaut weg, translated as Love Likes Away, has been translated into a number of languages, won the ICOM Independent Award, and has been trans awarded with the E.O. Plauen for the Prize, the Plauen Sponsorship Award. Together with Jochen Schmidt, her book Studentbooks and Sch Schmidtologie, which we have in our library as well, were recently published. Her scratchboard works are regularly featured in a number of different magazines and newspapers, including Strapazin, Le Monde Diplomatique, and the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. She's currently, or was just, the Max Kata Distinguished Visiting Professor at Dartmouth College this spring, and she has been described as um, the beautiful sister Robert Crumb always wished for. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then I would like to introduce uh, Nora Crew, uh, who happens to be an alumni as well uh, and went to the same program. Uh, however, so much more accomplished and quite talented. Uh, Nora is the author and artist whose drawings and visual narratives have appeared in periodicals including uh, the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, The Guardian, and Le Monde Diplomatique. Did I get that right? I hope I got it right. Uh, and in anthologies published by uh, Houghton Mifflin, Harcourt, uh, Simon & Schuster, and Chronicle Books. Uh, Krug has won fellowships from the John, John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation and the Maurice Sendak Foundation. Uh, the Pollock Krasner Foundation and the Fulbright Program, rather prestigious. Uh, her visual narratives won three gold medals at the so Society of Illustrators, a silver cube from the Art Directors Club, uh, and were chosen for Houghton Mifflin's Best American Comics and Best American uh, Non-Required Reading. Her animations, which are amazing, were shown at the Sundance Film Festival, and her books are included in the Library of Congress, uh, the Sundance Collection at UCLA, and the Rare Books and Manuscript library at Columbia University. Uh, Krug also happens to be an associate professor at Parsons School of Design in New York City, uh, and we're fortunate to have her and Lena here. So without further delay, uh, I'd love to introduce Nora Krug. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me in the back row? Okay. Um, so uh, I'm an author and illustrator and also an associate professor at Parsons. 
Um, uh, the, the theme of tonight's uh, event is cultural identity, and we're going to focus on that in our talks, but also in the conversation afterwards. So um, I would like to start talking a little bit about um, why I think illustration is uh, a medium that has always communicated cultural and social political ideas, and then talk about how that has impacted my own work as an author and illustrator. Um, so what, what interests me so much about illustration as a medium is that, it's intrinsically, that it is intrinsically political. Illustrations have reflected our worldviews, cemented our social hierarchies, and affirmed our religious belief systems, reminding us of what will happen if we don't adhere to the moral codes our societies have established. At the same time, illustration makes no claims to objectivity. Illustrations don't really document who we are, but they communicate in direct or subtle ways who we perceive ourselves to be and how we want to be seen by the outside. By doing so, they constantly draw a line between the familiar and the foreign. In its most extreme form, of course, illustration has been used as a propagandistic tool to exclude and persecute. Uh, these examples here, these two different illustrations, show a re recurring visual theme that originated in Central Europe in the 13th century, showing a Jewish man in obscene contact with a pig. In the 1930s and 40s, the Nazis, of course, drew on this tradition and invented their own illustrated propaganda. Uh, this is an image of a mushroom depicting a Jewish man. In a unique way, illustrations can create direct access to historic events and provide an emotional understanding of the personal experience of politics. As illustrators, I feel that it's our responsibility to look, to witness, to uncover, and to make visible the challenges that we face in our world. One of my own main interests as an artist is the subject of war. And by creating narratives, I aim to explore how war can shape the human consciousness over generations and how it impacts individuals who are neither considered heroes nor villains, figures largely unknown to the public, and I believe that it is their stories which can add a lot to our understanding of the nuanced reality of war. I'm going to show you a few examples of, just a few excerpts of some of the short visual narratives I've done on the subject of war. Uh, this one uh, was done for Le Monde Diplomatique in Germany and then for a public space, which is a literary magazine based in Brooklyn. And it's about a Japanese soldier from World War II uh, by the name of Hiro Onoda, who um, was stationed uh, on the Philippines. And when the Americans arrived, he was hiding uh, in the Philippine jungle, I believe, for, yeah, for 29 years, thinking that the war was still going on. And whenever um, Japanese uh, uh, government officials came to the island to look for him, he hid and he just, he imagined that they were uh, American actors impersonating Japanese um, officials. And uh, it was only when a Japanese uh, tourist came to the island, uh, as a, basically he was just uh, hiking there and slept in a tent in the jungle on the Philippines, and his goal was to find this man, and they, they found, he found him. He eventually found him and was able to convince him that he wouldn't be punished even if he returned uh, to Japan. And so the Japanese soldier said he would only emerge from the jungle if his former military commander would come to the island himself. And he was at that point an over 80-year-old uh, second-hand book dealer in Tokyo. And he came to the island and finally... Pers um, um, convinced this man to re-emerge. Um, another story I did was for Blab magazine, which is an American comics magazine called No Man's Land, and this one was about an American soldier called Robert Jenkins who was stationed uh, at the uh, Korean, s southern part of the Korean border, the border to North Korea, and uh, he defected to the north because he was afraid of being sent to Vietnam and he was captured and forced to remain there for 39 years. And um, finally, in the 90s, because of the diplomatic um, relationship that for a short time improved between South and North Korea at the time, he was able to return. But upon his return, he was immediately um, tried by the US military court as a defector. Um, but then he was pardoned, and he now lives in Japan. 
this is another story I did for the German comics magazine called Spring, and it was later also published in um, a public space. And it's about a Japanese kamikaze pilot during the Second World War who was drafted into the kamikaze unit, even though he didn't want to. He didn't want to die for his country. Um, but it was just a question of honor, and he didn't want to stay alive while seeing his friends die. And he um, got on the plane, and then the plane had um, engine problems, and he emergency landed on the sea and ended up on a tiny Japanese island uh, where there was no radio communication or anything to the rest of the world or to the rest of Japan. And he stayed there for several months, and then he found a way of returning to the base, to his military base. But on the way there, he had to go, he, he took a train, and the train went through Hiroshima. And it happened to be the day after the atomic bomb was dropped. So he got off the train just to change trains, and he walked around in this environment and decided in that moment, A, that the war was over and that he didn't have to continue as a kamikaze fighter, but also decided to become a pacifist. And that's, he still lives now in Tokyo as a retired soybean exporter and talks to people um, you know, against the war. Um, all of these projects uh, led me to explore my own uh, cultural heritage um, in a 260-page, fully illustrated and hand-lettered visual memoir about World War II and my German family history that will be published by Scribner in spring or fall 2018. And um, it's also coming out as a German edition for those of you who are affiliated with the Goethe Institute and want to read it in German by Knaus, probably around the same time. As a German of my generation, I grew up with a tremendous sense of guilt about what my grandparents' generation had done. The guilt we grew into uh, was a general abstract one, and conversations about what happened in our own towns, on our own streets, and in our particular families were non-existent. The book describes, through a combination of short comics, full-page illustrations, family photographs, flea market finds, and other historic documents, my search for my own grandparents and uncle, whose war experience and political attitude I knew nothing about before I embarked on the project, and connected to that, my search what, for what German identity really means to me. I realized that only by working on this book and by investigating and facing the stories that specifically happened in my family, I was able to, at least in part, overcome this abstract, paralyzing sense of guilt. The process of illustrating my grandfather's and uncle's stories allow me to envision their memories, picture more clearly the circumstances they found themselves in during the war, and make their experience tangible. The act of drawing itself forces me to imagine myself in their situation as I test the limits of my empathy for their decisions. The act of drawing thus becomes a form of research, a way of documenting the world around me, an attempt to constantly renegotiate my relationship with it. The book explores the idea of Germany as a wounded place, both in a physical, spatial, and in a metaphysical, emotional sense. By creating images to illustrate my family history, I create a visual chart that ideally will help me navigate my way back to the country I have lost. I'm going to read an excerpt from the book, which is going to be chapter three titled Poisonous Mushrooms. Every year, we traveled to Italy for a family vacation. To us, Italy represented everything Germany didn't have, or perhaps elements it once had, but lost in the perfectionist reconstruction of the post-war years. Here, we could feel uninhabited and live the exotic fantasy of Southern European life. We spent days driving around in our non-air-conditioned green Volvo, exploring small medieval towns, sampling local delicacies, visiting remote re museums, and following in the footsteps, footsteps of famous artists, writers, and filmmakers. On one of those excursions, we visited a large military cemetery. The cemetery's geometric precision was intimidating. Near the entrance, we found an inscription in German. Selig sind die da Leid tragen, denn sie sollen getröstet werden. Blessed are those who are suffering, for they shall be comforted. Buried beneath our feet lay the bodies of German, not Italian, World War II soldiers. 
A few decades after the end of the war, 30,683 of them had been dug up for identification from nearby provisional graves and finally reburied here. The cemetery was vast. We made our way through the labyrinth in silence. Suddenly, my father disappeared. After a while, we spotted him in the distance. He walked briskly and held a piece of paper in his hands. What are you looking for? My brother. I'd always known that I had an uncle who died young. He fell in the war, my father used to say, but nobody in the family seemed to know how or where he was killed. I knew that my uncle had been the heir to my grandparents' land in Kulsheim, a tiny town in southwest Germany, surrounded by fields, forests, and vineyards. I knew that my father was born a few years after my uncle's death and that his parents had named him after his dead brother, Franz Karl. I knew that because my uncle had died, they expected my father to inherit and tend to their farm and look after the animals, the fields, and the plum trees. And I knew that my father had never fulfilled that expectation. As a teenager, I discovered a musty smelling box in the drawer of the mahogany cabinet in our living room. It contained old photographs of my uncle and a few of his sixth grade school exercise books. They described the life cycle of the Maybach and the history of European forestry, the heroic Viking adventures and the havoc of the Thirty Years' War, the importance of charity and the necessity for personal hygiene, the Führer's difficult childhood and his reintroduction of Mother's Day to celebrate German women and their Aryan children. Number two, how I honored my darling mother. When I woke up on Mother's Day, I quickly got out of bed and put on my clothes, then quickly into the garden to pick a bunch of flowers, which I put next to Mother's bed. When she woke up, I gave her my best Mother's Day wishes. Then I went out into the kitchen and put a cup on the table for her. On the cup, it said Mother's Day. I also put a piece of cake on the table. At noon, I went into the forest and picked a bunch of Mayflowers for her. May 31st, 1938. All throughout my father's childhood, his mother told him that his brother had been a sweet and well-behaved boy. Unlike my father, who was a stubborn and ill-tempered child, my father spent days skipping first kindergarten, then school, playing all by himself on the grounds of Kulsheim's medieval castle. My uncle was a complete stranger to me. I didn't know anyone who had known him. War and death were the only things I associated with him. Because he had been one of Hitler's soldiers, I learned early on that I wasn't supposed to feel sadness over his early death. His photos and exercise books were the only physical evidence of his existence, and I tried desperately to find him somewhere in between the lines of his propagandistic essays. It was like searching a concrete wall for cracks and leaks. Examining the stories written in my uncle's neat handwriting and the illustrations with which he carefully decorated the margins was an intimate but chilling experience. The books intrigued me, but I never showed them to any of my friends. Number 11, the Jew, a poisonous mushroom. When you go to the forest and you see mushrooms that look beautiful, you think that they are good. But when you eat them, they are poisonous and they can kill a whole family. The Jew is just like this mushroom. When you see the Jew from behind, you don't immediately recognize him. But if you talk to him, you recognize him immediately. He pretends to be nice and flatters you shamelessly. Just like the poisonous mushroom can kill a whole family, the Jew can kill a whole people. From the notebook of a homesick emigre, Things German number three, Das Pilze sammeln. Collecting mushrooms with my family, examining each mushroom carefully and comparing it to the corresponding picture in the Pilzführer mushroom guidebook before placing it in the vo woven basket, back home scrubbing off the bits of earth on the stem and in, be in between the gills and then sautéing the mushrooms in a pan with butter, salt and pepper and eating them with a piece of dark rye bread. By eating the mushrooms, I feel as I've become part of the forest. The poisonous red and white polka dotted mushroom is depicted in many German children's books. On New Year's Day, it is a symbol of good luck that appears in shop windows, on greeting cards, and in marzipan sweets made in its shape. My mother dressed as a poisonous mushroom, 1953, costume made by my grandmother. To this day, she remembers the moment the picture was taken because of how disappointed she was that she couldn't be a princess instead. <laughs> 
My uncle signed his name beneath the mushroom story and added the date, January 20, 1939. On that same day, the mayor of Dachau reports that the town is now cleared of all Jews. A hearing in Berlin takes place about the sterilization of a mentally unstable woman. Stalin endorses the use of torture. And Josef Goebbels writes in his diary, talk things through with the Führer for two hours. He's so good and humane to me. One has to love him. Ten days later, Adolf Hitler will give a speech proclaiming that if Jewish financiers should plunge the nations into a world war yet again, the outcome will be the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. Was my uncle's story influenced by The Poisonous Mushroom, the 1938 collection of anti-Semitic children's stories? The book was given out for free by the National Socialists. In one of the stories, a mother and her blonde, lederhosen-clad son go for a walk in the forest, where she compares Jews to poisonous mushrooms. Coincidentally, the name of the boy in the story was Franz, the same name as my uncle's. It takes great effort to learn how to write. How much effort did it take my uncle to write a story like the one about the mushroom? The teacher marked three spelling mistakes and two grammatical mistakes in the mushroom story and signed it ST. Although he expected my uncle to do better, he was satisfied with the story's content. Adolf Hitler, 1938. Our youth shall learn nothing but to think German and to act German. A young boy or a young girl enters into our organizations at age 10. Then they move from the junior Hitler Youth to the Hitler Youth four years later, and will keep them there for another four years, and then put them into the party or the labor front, the assault division or the SS. And if there's still a bit of class consciousness and elitist thinking left in them, they will receive further treatment from the armed forces. And when they return after two or three or four years, we'll put them back into the assault division or SS so that they won't relapse. And they shall never be free again for the rest of their lives. My uncle, 1939, with a goat given to him for First Communion. My uncle was born in 1926. In 1936, the National Socialists announced that 90% of all children born in 1926 had successfully been recruited into the Hitler Youth. By 1939, joining had become mandatory. Kölsheim is a small town. Jews and Christians lived side by side, engaged in train for centuries. My uncle probably knew the Jewish boys and girls who lived in town. He was 12, 12 years old when he wrote the story in his exercise book. Too young to understand the power of Nazi propaganda, but old enough to understand that Jews are not like poisonous mushrooms. <laughs> From the scrapbook of a memory archivist, flea market find number one, child's play. A, caricature of a Jew, 20 cents. B, toy made in honor of the Führer's birthday, four euros. C, Hitler youth trading cards, set of 10, two euros. D, brooches given in exchange for winter relief donations, four euros each. E, primer, one euro. It turned out that my father had gone up to the cemetery chapel and, for reasons unknown even to himself, had scanned the names in the register. There, among the thousands of names, his eyes rested on for a fraction of a second. Names that had once been called from kitchen windows at dinner time. Names written on Christmas gifts and school exercise books. Names spoken severely in classrooms. Names pronounced ceremoniously by mayors on enlistment day. Names whispered by girls and women the night before departure. Names shouted on the battlefield when a response could no longer be expected. Names reported to superiors. Names spelled out on clacking typewriters in colonel, secretary's offices. Names read, reread, and read again on damp military stationery. Names chiseled into stones. Names remembered quietly by fathers and mothers before a final breath was taken. Among all these names, unfamiliar names, belonging to people unknown to him, my father found what he had been looking for, his own name. The numbers on the piece of paper that my father was holding specified the exact location of my uncle's grave. The gravestone was meticulously ins maintained. Inscribed on it was the name that my uncle and my father had always shared. For the first time, I experienced the loss of my uncle's life in a physical way. Briefly, he emerged from the depths of the heavy mahogany cabinet, not as a shadow, but as a human being whose eyes I could have looked into and said, uncle, 
who could have given me a goat as a gift for First Communion, whose children's outgrown clothes I could have worn, and to whom I could have sent a postcard from Italy that summer, telling him about our visit to a German World War II cemetery that was filled with gravestones inscribed with the names of total strangers. Standing at his grave, I longed to understand what it felt like to be him. Was he proud to fight in the war? Was he afraid? What was the last thing he saw, the last thought he had? My brother took a photograph of the grave. This is the closest I've ever been to my brother, my father said. Two photographs placed on top of each other match perfectly. Two arms, each holding a First Communion candle. Two arms, each holding a hymn book. The new face that emerges looks directly at me. Thank you. Wow, <laughs> that's really hard to follow up on that. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to do a talk here today, and especially to the Goethe Institute and the SVA. Um, my name is Lena Hofen, and um, I'm an illustrator and a cartoonist. And this is Goethe holding my book, which I was <laughs> really did happen back in the days. Um, Nora and I agreed to do a talk on cultural identity, where we are from, how we work, um, why we work on the subjects that we work on. So I will lead you a little bit through my life. Um, and it starts actually in Ostwestfalen Lippe, which is a really, really small village of like 300 people that I grew up in. And this is one of my first artworks I ever did. I took a picture out of my childhood room, trying to get those three cows parallel to each other. <laughs> this is the best <laughs> shot I got. <laughs> and um, that was actually the biggest excitement also I had as a kid. Um, I have two older brothers that tortured me the entire childhood. And the only way I could escape was drawing how they could die, actually. <laughs> um, and at a certain moment, I noticed that I was so good in drawing that they would make me draw their pictures for school and pay me for that. So that was when I decided that I would become an illustrator. And um, before I could start doing that, I started working at the State Theatre of Kassel as a costume and set designer. And after a few, well, two years, I noticed that there's always someone in the choir complaining about, you know, how should I get up that thing, whatever you invented there, or the shoes don't fit well, I can't sing in those shoes. And I was so fed up after two years that I thought, I, I have all these pictures in my mind that I want to have like a stage um, made for. Um, that I have to do something different. I can't work at the theater. So I went to the art school in Kassel, to the Rob Scholte class. And I know it looks really depressing, but it was a wonderful place to study at. And right here, this is where we got our food, and it was the place I hung out the most and um, thought about what I should do with my life. So the professors would only show up maybe once a month and look at our artwork. And um, I figured really fast that this is not going to get me anywhere because I didn't produce anything. So I switched the school to the Hamburger Angewandte, well, it's Hamburg Applied School of Sciences. And Nora even taught there for, I think, two semesters? Or no, one? just for two summers. Two summers, um, and I had this teacher, and she looks really nice. Her name is Anke Feuchtenberger, and she belongs to the German comic avant-garde. Um, and even though she looks this nice, these are pictures <laughs> she does. But she also has superheroes in her stories, not the ones that you would expect, but very female and very powerful. And the other professor I had was Atak. And as you can tell by this 
wonderful hair blow dryer in the shape of a duck. He collects all these amazing things. This is his shelf. And if you recognize anything, just shout it out now. And now look at his artwork. Also, besides all these things, we share another passion, which is music and pop references that you can see Andy Warhol, the Ramones, many things that he has in his artwork. And we also like, we have a common fable for classic artwork that we work with. And this is a portrait he did of me for an article on the new generation of comic artists from Germany. And um, you can tell, well, I used to work in a record store and we would always talk about music. So I'm wearing a Kings of Convenience t-shirt and in the background you see the Charles Burns picture that I really had next to my desk and the little dough boy in the background um, because he's my favorite figure of all times. I <laughs> Doughboy makes me so happy. I could call him like my, is it like a spirit thing? It's <laughs> Doughboy. So having these two teachers, everything kind of went black for me because I had this really dark and like Anke Feuchtenberger was really deep into, into um, philosophy and so many deep thoughts. And then I had Attack on the other side who was so bright and colorful that I really had no idea what to do with my life and where to go. So when everything turned black, I noticed that there's a technique actually that you can work with to scratch away the black and it's called scraper board or scratch board and you have little knives that you use to scratch away the black. Um, and I used this technique to do my first graphic novel. It's called Liebe schaut weg, Love looks away. That's a quote actually from a song from Beck um, that I really like. And um, it's about looking away and not <coughs> love turns a blind eye because I think that if you love someone, you decide to not look at certain things. So this is my family memoir that I did as a final thesis for art school. And it starts with my grandfather Erich Hofen, who was part of the Hitler Youth in the 1930s. And um, every story in the book is uh, told in the language that it's settled in. So it speaks, it's in the beginning, it's German in the 30s and the 40s. Um, it continues with the U.S. because I'm half American and half German. So the first episode is my grandfather making his first radio that he ever made. And he told me this story when I was playing exactly this song, Mendelssohn, on the piano um, when I was 13. And he started crying while I was playing the song. And I've never seen my grandfather cry ever. He was a really strong man. And so I stopped playing because I didn't know what was going on. And then he told me the story that when he built his first radio and he heard exactly this sound, and this might sound strange, but he thought, okay, something so beautiful by a Jewish composer, and he was not supposed to listen to the song, he thought, that Jewish people can't be bad. And it sounds like this is a, I mean, for us, of course, no, but for him, it was a totally new thought that he never had before, um, being part of the Hitler Youth. So um, he did decide to stay in Hitler Youth and even met my grandma in the Hitler Youth camp. That's the picture that's missing up there. And this is my grandma Irmgard and my grandfather Erich, who even became part of the SS. The next story is in the 40s. Um, and this is my grandma Catherine Laurie. And um, th this is her on her way for skating for the very first time in her life, where she meets my grandfather um, 
and he's a professional ice hockey player. <laughs> so he teaches her how to skate. And this is their wedding picture up there. And it looks like it's an old cathedral, but it's not. It's just like a photo screen that was pulled down. <laughs> you can see the line down there. And this is my mother, Charlotte, with Santa Claus. The 50s continue with Germany again with my father, Reinhard. And he was totally into reading science fiction books. Uh, so this is a real cover of Utopia. It's called Escape to the Future, Flucht in die Zukunft. And he would stay up nights, read underneath the cover and read those books. And my grandma was really unhappy because science fiction and comics back then were uh, concerned um, pulp fiction. And uh, in German, it's Schund Literatur. And she was very, very upset with him doing that. So she told him not to. But on the other hand, my grandmother had her own escape to the future, things that she really wished for, the technology that she was hoping for. So in the end, she allowed my father to read, uh, continue reading science fiction, but he had to read it in English. <laughs> this is my mother's flight ticket as a foreign exchange student from Kalamazoo College in Michigan going to Bonn um, in the 60s. And this is my dad and my mom dancing in a club on a blind date. And this is actually the moment that my father told me he fell in love deeply with my mom because she told him to come closer. And he thought, wow, what a lady. And that she tells me to come closer, wow. And uh, my mom told me she never said that. <laughs> So then, of course, my American grandparents had to come to Germany and meet this Reinhard guy, Reinhard. And on every picture that's in that photo album, you can see that my grandfather, my American grandfather, is so unhappy about my mother's choice, marrying a German. Um, he wanted to fight in the war against Germany, but he couldn't because of a tuberculosis issue he had. So for him, Germany was still the enemy. He could not understand how his daughter chose to marry someone from Germany. So when, when the moment comes that my father asks to marry my mother, my American grandfather said no. But in the end, and I'm a bit of a spoiler, they did get married. <laughs> and they decided to move from the US to Germany. In the beginning, my father is a doctor. They lived in the US, but he was not feeling comfortable being an, a German and not fully understand English as much as he thought he should to be a good doctor. So they moved back to Germany. And these are some of the original photographs. This is my grandfather, Harold. This is the real wedding picture. And this is my mom with my grandma. And sometimes I chose to add people to the picture, like in this case, it's my uncle Mike down there. <laughs> or I would change the entire picture to tell a story. For example, this is Christmas 1958, and this is the way I chose to change it and have a comparison to Germany. Sometimes I would just make up photographs that don't exist like this one. And in Germany, we have this saying, um, mehr la meta, which is the stuff that you have on the Christmas tree, the decoration. And you can tell this is the US and this is Germany. <laughs> so my parents, um, I asked them back then for the final thesis if I may use their real names. And they said, sure, go ahead. I mean, nobody's going to read it anyway. <laughs> Now they're going to, ha they have their love story in, I think, five different languages translated. Um, I did this, the first episode for this book uh, for Orang, which my, is my artist group in Hamburg. And this is us back in the days when my baby was still one year old on my lap. That's Matti Hoven. Now he is nine. And we had to stop Orang on the 10th issue because we all had so many things going on, we couldn't do it anymore. 
But doing Urang and having a subject that we all had to work on as students was actually the best thing because we all got publishers for our own work. So if you do comics, do an anthology. And it's a perfect thing where you can just try out stuff, like I did the story Forever Yours uh, of a stripper meeting a professor from the English department. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you now that I've been at Dartmouth, it really looks like that. If you're <laughs> it's totally like that. Um, when I was pregnant with my son, I thought, what kind of relationship will we have? Will he like me? Will he maybe hate me? You never know. And so I did the story for Le Monde Diplomatique, um, where this boy has to decide, will I save my mother's life? Um, she has a toxic reaction to a bee sting. Or will I go to a KISS concert <laughs> with this really cute girl I've just met, Chrissy, that always wears tight t-shirts? Well, he saves her life. Um, this is a story I did for Strapazin, where I just tried to tell stories in a different way. Um, you have to compare the two pictures to understand the story, and it, it's like six pages of comparing and finding the ten differences between the pictures. Or for also for Spring, where Nora took part as well, I did the story where you just tell the story by reading the leg legend of the picture. So number one is the first letter, number two is the freshly painted room, and the story tells you something about a woman who loses her baby uh, down here at number seven, waiting for the husband to return home. And in this picture, you can even tell where she buried the child. Mm -hmm. These are other works I did for Spring um, about naked women and cats. <laughs> It's the first time I wrote stories, and it's actually it was a lot of fun to write about <laughs> overweight cats and why they got <laughs> overweight. And um, when the Spring Collective is only women doing comics, so it, uh, that those were two women, two women who founded Spring that were rejected by Orang, the other artists group. So they thought, we should do our own magazine, and it actually turned out to be more successful than the other one. <laughs> and we do exhibitions where we sell our pictures. Actually, that's the thing that I make a most of a living of. I sell original artwork. I would really like to tell you the story, but we don't have the time. But those are my mean brothers. <laughs> And um, after I did Liebe schaut weg, I was asked to do a newspaper column for the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. And the first book I did was um, this one, Dudenbrooks. I will just hand this out to you really fast. And it's the alphabet. It starts with A and it stops with, with Z. And here you can see someone who's tortured by malaria and he has someone reading Märchen, which is fairy tales to him, and all those masks. And um, after that, I was asked to do another newspaper column, and it's called Schmythologie. And here, um, we try to explain Greek words in a really fun way. So this is the Adams family watching TV to find out if they're still normal or not. <laughs> And as my professor Atak, I like to do cover versions, not of songs, but of pictures like this one, or use references as Freud, <laughs> or even American ones like Little Nemo. This was the picture, of course, for this event. And also my childhood memories that I use. I just saw the original of this picture yesterday, and I was overwhelmed. So this is the book, Schmythologie. Um, I was invited after Liebe schaut weg to go to, um, I, ha I got a literature um, fellowship at this house. It's the Literarische Kolloquium Berlin. And I met a lot of authors there, and I was able to um, draw pictures of their desks and how they work and how they tape their windows so they don't see anything outside and just <laughs> keep on writing. 
and also meet authors that I was able to do illustrations for their books. This is going to be published by my first American publisher now, Godine Books, and he asked me to redraw this picture because he said women in the US don't read on the toilet. It's a European thing. <laughs> I don't know. Also, the big pictures that I do sell are pictures like this that I did for the Eo Plauen Award. And my brother tells me that all of the guys in my pictures look like my father. <laughs> but actually, it's Michael Caine. <laughs> this I did for the Basel um, Art Institute. This for Rüsselsheim, where Nora also had an exhibition. And this is my uh, the last artwork I did for um, a commissioned work for a father for, her for his daughter that is very much into this picture. And you can see it up there, and it's a cover version of her with her dog that had just died. This is a cover I did for the Jochen Schmidt book, um, Zuckersand, and the publishing house just decided to color the picture without asking me, actually. And um, the recent storytelling I did with my, this is me and my grandma, and how we spent time at Lake Michigan. That was just published two months ago. And this is an example of my latest newspaper column. It's about couples and how they talk with each other. And this is, of course, the first episode. And this is the second, Simone de Beauvoir and uh, Jean-Paul Sartre talking about the shopping she did for him and if she forgot his kefir or not. <laughs> the technique. It's scraper board, scratch board, and um, I usually do a very detailed drawing and then I transfer it on the board. And because it's kind of, kind of hard to explain, I would just like you to have a scratch. So, this is the Oprah moment. I've prepared a little something. Um, this is a sample of scratch board and a knife, and I want you to just try it. So, I usually have like one of those knives. I wear a glove and something to protect me from getting this kind of Sehenscheidwentzündung. So I'm so protected. And this is a detail where you can see that I have the white outlines and then I just start to scratch in. And while you scratch, I will show you a week in my life. So this is after about three weeks of work. Um, you can see that by the wallpaper in the background. So this is day one, day two, Day three, four, five, six, seven, done. That was it. <laughs> Um, so we, this was actually the first, the <laughs> they first chose the naked pictures, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, the first time that we've ever met, we just met today a few hours ago, um, despite the fact that we have a lot of uh, commonalities, I mean you pointed some of them out, uh, we're both, both German and American, I just became an American last year, you've always been one. Um, we both live, uh, you live in Hamburg, I spent two years in Hamburg. Um, we both worked for the same co comics collective called uh, Spring that um, Lina showed some pictures from. Uh, we also lived abroad when we were teenagers. Um, you in Texas? I was in Texas, yes. Um, at a high school and I in uh, Toronto, going to high school there for three months. Um, and for both of us, as we discovered earlier during our conversation, um, we, that was one of the first instances when we um, 
when we were able to look at our culture from afar and also were maybe confronted with certain stereotypes of being German, you mentioned to me, can I? Yes. That uh, one day um, when Lena went to her locker, um, somebody had written the word Nazi on it. And um, so I think that was maybe a key, a key time for both of us that led us to think about what being German means and to maybe realize that German identity is still deeply connected to our experience of war and how do we deal with it uh, having grown up in a school system that was very um, almost indoctrinating, I mean for good reason, but um, about our past, but in a very generalized way, um, in a very abstract way, collective guilt basically was what we grew up with, yet we didn't really know about our own families and our own histories. So both of us explore this idea of how we construct these narratives and what we then do with these narratives in order to define who we are. And uh, we decided uh, to focus on just two books where we feel like we converge the most, which is Lena's book, uh, Love Looks Away, and my upcoming book, um, yet untitled, but uh, in America it's probably going to be called Heimat. In Germany they hate the idea of that title. Yeah, because of course. Yeah. <laughs> so, deeply um, associated with so many things. Um, anyway, so um, yeah, we decided to just talk about that. And my first question to you would be, um, what drove you to write this book, this family memoir? So when I was in Texas, actually, I um, had this Nazi incident. And also, we watched that movie Schindler's Liste. And I, I could just tell that the moment that it, that it was mandatory in, in, in that grade. So after everyone had watched that movie, people just started treating me differently. So coming back to Germany, on the other hand, there was this very big anti-American movement going on and I felt like I had to, I couldn't really decide which side do I belong to. So when I was in the US I felt like I have to defend Germans or defend German culture and tell them well not all of us were Nazis or I didn't even know what to say about it. Actually I did a talk on the Weiße Rose which was strange doing that, but I thought I had to do something. The resistance movement. Yes. Um, the German resistance movement. The German resistance movement. And then coming back to Germany, I thought I should tell everyone that the US is not as they think it is, not as superficial. That was a cliche back then, or it still is kind of, yeah. And so how did you decide working on that book? Um, I found diaries of my grandma, of my German grandma, and then I decided to um, read them and look through and kind of make, make a sense of comparing the stories that have been told me with what is written and with the photo albums that I had. And um, it was really interesting that each story that I'm telling has, it's like a lot of people told stories in a very different way and I had to make up the version that I believe is true or felt true and um, that family identity is something that is always kind of like a bubble it changes all the time with the stories that are told inside of a family and in the end I still don't know which side I belong to I don't know what, what it felt, I mean, what, what, what did you, why did you choose to do this book? Um, well, I had been working on these short narratives that I showed excerpts from earlier, um, and I realized they were all about war, but none of them were about Germany, they were all about other countries. And then uh, my agent at the time, my illustration agent at the time said, why don't you do something about Germany? Um, and, and then I realized that that was the reason why I always did stories about war. And I think the reason why I had avoided it is because um, it's such a big topic, obviously, in Germany, and so much has been written about it. And I just didn't know, I didn't feel like I had the right to do it in a way. I didn't know if I had a story to tell. Um, also, none of my grandparents were um, you know, prominent Nazis or victims. And this is 
then I realized that this is exactly what I'm interested in, is that gray group in the middle, because that's, I think, the hardest to tackle, because as you just said, um, it's hard to know what side you're, in, uh, you're on or what, what, um, who your family was if you belong to this big group of what we call um, midläufer, which means followers. And um, I realized that um, the book should be about as you said as well, my personal experience, and that would, would be the only legitimate way in which I could tell a story, would be to make it as personal as possible and not try to be historian or not talk about other people, but really deeply think about what it means to me and how um, discovering new things while working on the book about my family, um, how that impacts me. And um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's what I decided to do. And the book for me is an attempt of both finding out who my grandparents and my uncle were, um, and then you know, trying to figure out how, how that impacts my feelings of guilt and if there's any way in which I can overcome at least this abstract feeling of guilt by working on the book. Um, and tied to that, deeply tied to that, is the question, question of German cultural identity, because our identity is still deeply connected to the war. We can't separate it from the war. So um, that's what, um, that's, that was the initial driving point of the story. I thought it was really interesting. To, we're exactly the same age. And when I saw that you had this, we don't know the words of our national anthem, that might sound strange to Americans, but we just, we don't, we, we didn't grow up with that at all. So we only knew the parts that we were not supposed to sing. I don't know if it was the yeah, same I don't, for you. I still don't. I'm I embarrassed me, no, to say, but, but I still <laughs> don't know. No, but we do know the parts that we are not supposed to sing. And if somebody does that, we can, you know, we're like, oh, you're not supposed to say that. But and um, it's for me, it's always weird that whenever there's a soccer game on, my American mother starts wearing all these German flag stuff. You know, she has like this hairdo and the color in her face and everything. And she's like, I don't get why you Germans are not patriotic at all. But for me, it still feels like I'm not supposed to. I, I just can't. It feels strange, even though it's a different flag, but no. And even when you watch German soccer matches, uh, often when the anthem is played, you actually see that a lot of the German players don't move their mouths at all. and they just Because they probably don't know as well. Yeah, and maybe they don't want to sing yeah. it. Um, and it's interesting because obviously it's changing a little bit. I mean, in my book, I also write about an experience I had returning to Berlin and attending one of the World Cups, the one where Germany won tremendously against Brazil. And it was really interesting to watch the whole development of the game because the uh, re TV announcers were almost ashamed. You know, they basically, instead of being cheerful, they said, we shouldn't get too elated now, you know, when the third goal was, uh, was made. And, the, the restaurant where I watched the game was really in a gloomy mood because we won so many goals that we felt really uncomfortable. And the whole game was hosted by Brazil and we played against, and Brazil lost to, to very, you know, I think they, they shot one goal. And, um, and yeah, and then, and then especially in Berlin, I mean, other cities are different, but uh, I saw cars that had stickers saying, Germany, no thank you and um, who lo whoever loves Germany, one can only hate, you know, those kind of slogans during the World Cup. And um, it's understandable, but it's also sad because it really, I mean, what, how do you know who you are if you don't have that um, positive narrative that in America people seem to grow up with so naturally? You know, how can you, how can you know who, who you are when you reject or or maybe just only don't understand where you come from. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about the image making part of that mm -hmm. um, because I'm curious about how creating the images and engaging in this um, visual act has perhaps helped you or not um, deal with this question of guilt or identity. I thought it was well, for example, the story of my grandfather, the first one uh, building the radio, um, I imagined him because the, the thought he had was so simple for me, well, so childish. I drew him as a small boy, but in fact he was already 17. 
And I didn't change that because that's the part of my memory and that's how I visualized myself, the whole story. And of course, it's strange to draw a more innocent because that's how I influence the reader's decision, if you like the character or not. But that was the only way I could cope with the memory. And I'm part of this family. I'm not, it's not a documentary. It's me telling stories in a way that I can, I'm the only one that could do it this way. I don't know what if, I mean, you also said you're not, you didn't, your goal was not being really precise in doing a documentary, but it did, I mean, all those facts that you had in your reading. Um, well, I'm not making anything up in the book, but I'm imagining uh, a lot um, in the images. So I think that to me is the role, because I mix photography and illustration a lot, and to me, whenever I use photography, I use it to portray a, an exact moment in history, because to me, sometimes a photograph can be much more powerful in that way. Uh, that's why I used photographs in my story about the kamikaze pilot too. I think showing the actual moment before departure where these young men are drinking their last cup of sake to me felt stronger than if I had drawn it because then there's another element of distance. Sometimes you need the distance in order to be able to, and maybe that's why you um, drew some of the family photographs instead of using the original ones. Um, and that's why uh, Art Spiegelman uh, used animals instead of humans, uh, because he needed to be able to distance himself from his own family narrative. Um, and to me, the illustrations um, pick up those moments that um, I have no proof for, but that could be true. I mean, so for example, moments of my grandfather's life where he, um, I'm just trying to think about uh, an example that I could, um, I mean, I, I didn't go into this uh, in this presentation because I talked about my uncle, but, um, you know, for example, the, the, the moment when my uncle was drafted into the SS, um, you know, what was that like? What, um, and uh, it's a challenge, too, because you have to convey something, some emotion, and if you don't know how he felt, um, how, do you, how do you show that situation? How do you portray the face, um, so you have to be subtle sometimes. Um, yeah, but I, everything I state in the book is based on whatever I could find out, um, so there is no fictitious quality to it, but um, a lot of it is imagined when I couldn't find proof for the actual situations that I'm portraying. Um, but we talked a little bit earlier about this inability of, um, I mean, about the fact that we really construct our family histories and stories and that they're um, told from generation to generation and they make up who we are because we, we are not just who we are today. I mean, we are a product of those stories and of our country's histories and um, I think um, that is probably an important part of both of our books. Um, it's, the f it's really the family identity. I mean, I did this with students at Dartmouth as well. We, they had to do a presentation of, on their family identity. And they would show pictures out of their photo album of their parents and then tell the class, what is the family identity? Do we say we are um, totally in our s into sports or we are a family of winners or we are a family of well, one girl had just cooking things. It was all about what the family eats. And um, I thought it was that it's really important to, if you want to know your own cultural identity, to be aware of your family's identity and what your family wants you to think of the family. So it's really hard for us with these <coughs> books to get all this additional information of the own identity. And in the end, it's a lot about editing because you can't tell your entire life or the entire life of your family. But um, uh, you know what? What is it that you pick? I mean, that's what documentary filmmakers do too. They are, of course, a driving force in the narrative. Nothing is ever objective. I mean, that's why I showed those historic examples. I think, and that shouldn't be the goal. I think the goal is to tell a story um, that is, of course, impacted by what we think and what we believe in, and memory is something that mutates, it's not a, and history too, I mean history was written by the winners always and um, in reality history is just a collection, a series of individually experienced moments 
and I think we're trying to bring them back to life. And I think that's also the, the goal being that um, you show a more uh, nuanced, you know, aspect of, of the war. Um, I don't know how long we've been talking. I don't know. For, so but, um, do we still have time for Q and A, or yeah. is that it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so I guess we've got a good. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I guess we've got a good uh, 10, 15 minutes to do a, a Q and A. Uh, thank you. That was was exceedingly insightful. I know. That I've got. <laughs> Um, so we, we are recording this uh, for uh, the school and iTunes U, so I've got a microphone uh, for those who have questions, and I'll, I'll be running around or throwing it at you to catch. So uh, who's, got the, who's got the first question? I guess it's kind of ghoulish, but I just wondered, like growing up in Germany, as you both did, I just wondered what they taught uh, the students about World War II and the Nazi atrocities. What did they really tell you? Were they honest or? Yeah, I mean that's uh, what I said when I was talking about indoctrination. Maybe I should have been uh, clearer about that because um, it was an endless bombardment. I mean, I'm talking about Western Germany, Western Germany. Um, bombardment of um, all the horrible stuff we've done and um, watching documentaries, uh, going to concentration camp museums interviewing um, old ladies who came from America who had survived the camps and talked to us. Um, so, uh, you know, that's how the feeling of collective shame was created, I it, think. It has changed a little bit today. My son is in second grade and uh, they haven't talked about it yet, but I know we started in second grade. Um, so at age seven or eight? Yes, about... Hitler. I mean, I knew in second grade who Hitler is, and I, d I knew <coughs> a lot of stuff. I mean, it was just, we did that actually every year, I think. In school, we had some subject that was connected to, to Hitler, and... Yeah. And now, too, I mean, when I go back to Germany, I switch on the TV. Every night, there is at least one program about the war, and showing you know, the horrible images, and um, I think, I mean, that's why I said at the beginning of the presentation, I'm really a believer in seeing. I, I feel like it's our responsibility to look, and as illustrators, to show and to uncover. And um, so I, I think it was very important that we see these images and that we continue to look at them. Um, and to me, my experience also working on the book has been that my I look at them differently every, you know, as the years pass by. I look at, I see new things in them, and... Um, I uh, teaching at Parsons. Um, I've been teaching a class called Visual Politics, which I co-teach with a politi uh, political science professor called Vicky Hattam. And so uh, we bring back, uh, together people from, because Parsons is affiliate is part of the New School, which is a university here in New York City. And um, so the class combines students from the New School of social research and from the Parsons School of Design and each student, all the students have to engage to an equal degree in research, writing, theory and image making or art making about political subjects in the widest, uh, you know, um, form. And um, so we look at political images with the students a lot and I also always every year give a short um, historical presentation about uh, the history of documentary film and how the practice has changed over the decades and how documentaries are told now as opposed to at the begin beginning of documentary filmmaking. And one of the things, one of the films I show is um, Night and Fog um, that was written by Alain Rosnez, I think. And um, I think it's a very powerful poetic way of looking at the Holocaust. And it was done, I think, in the early 50s, um, so at a very difficult time. At first, he didn't want to make a film about it, but then he, he agreed to. And you see the images of dead bodies. And one of my students was from Israel, and she told me afterwards that she had never seen these images. And I was really shocked. Uh, and I don't know if that's common or if it was just her particular school in Israel but I um, you know I was I was so shocked because I felt like our understanding of the war and the Holocaust is so different I mean would would be so different if we didn't have these images and if we had never looked at them in fact 
we still haven't seen images of Hiroshima because they were censored by the American military for so long. So we don't really have a clear idea of what it is we did by dropping the bomb. And I think it's so incredibly important. And um, I don't know how I ended up talking about this, but <laughs> I just, uh, yeah, just to your question, Jesse, that it's, uh, I think it's just very important. It was very important that we saw and l learned about these things in Germany. And I, I hope that it will continue with the future generations, especially now that they don't know the, the perpetrators in person anymore because they're dying or have died for the most part. Uh, your books are a lot about your families. Um, have your families read your books? How did they feel about them? Well, my, my parents read the book, and it's uh, the strange part is that my I told this Nora before uh, we before this talk that every time I talk to my father about the book, he is totally surprised that my grandfather was in the SS, and we continue having this discussion. So every time I talk to him again, and this has been happening, I think, four or five times, he's like, oh, I didn't know that. And it, he just forgets. And I think that's the only way he can cope with the information is that he just forgets every time. And so um, it, but it has been strange. The, there, were, there were different reactions. My grandmother died eight years ago. and. When she died, the book was next to her lazy chair, like the lazy boy, is that how you call it? <laughs> it, it was right next to her, so, and with that, the TV program, so I guess she did look at it a few times. Mine hasn't been published yet, so um, <laughs> I'll see what happens, but uh, my parents have been incredibly supportive. Um, they feel like you know, these things should be talked about, and they've been even helping me with certain aspects of the research. But when I was about to do a reading in my hometown this summer, um, she suddenly said, but, you know, but will, but will you talk about my family? And then I said to her, a lot of people in Germany will read about everything about your family. You knew that, didn't you? And just the fact that I was going to read in my hometown suddenly brought it close to her, and then I said, um, is it okay for you that I'm writing this book? And then she said, then she realized that it was um, naive of her to, uh, in retrospect, uh, you know, have doubts about it, but uh, she said, yes, of course, it's okay. And I told her that she should be proud of the fact that she has been so open with this family history, and um, hopefully that could be inspiring to um, some of her friends who would attend the reading in my hometown. But um, yeah, I mean, there's just one woman, one person who is still alive who um, could be, uh, you know, could have maybe doubts, but um, I don't think I don't think that would that will be the case. I mean, all the people who were part of the war who are right about um, are dead. I mean, all my grandparents um, were died by the time uh, were dead by the time I was 11. So um, that's partly what drove me to do the book because by the time I learned about the Holocaust, which I don't think was as early as you. Um, maybe around 12, um, they had all died, so I never had the chance to ask them. So the book is a way of trying to find out who they really were. Hi, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about your research process, and talking to family members or how you gathered your information. Um, I talked to my uncle about the, the American uncle, about the U.S. memories with my mom. I had a lot of photo albums. I had diaries. And um, also, big parts of it is actually, those were all stories that have been told to me as a kid. So that's why they're not, it's not documented in that way. It's just the way I remember them and some additional information. And of course, I left out a few things. Like, I don't know, my grandma told me back then when my grandfather took her home from ice skating, she could hear all the beer bottles in the back of his car. <laughs> and that she was kind of concerned about that. And so, but I left that out because it's just, you know, yeah. So yeah, I used memories and I, my memories and whatever I could find on documents. Um, I, uh, I engaged in various different kinds of research. Um, and it's interesting because my uncle came from a small village and my grandfather from a city. 
And it was much harder to get personal connections in the city because people come and go more. In the village, memory is just transferred more. There's just a, it's much longer lasting. It's, it seems to be more distilled the way it's communicated from generation to generation. Every, everybody knows what somebody's grandfather did 70 years ago um, because there's a lot of gossip. And um, so I did go to the village where my uncle grew up and interviewed people who are still alive who knew them, who knew him. And, um, and then my grandfather who lived in a city, so my maternal grandfather, I went to the archive and did a lot of research like that. And one exciting starting point for me at the time was looking at old phone books and finding his name. And slowly his business appeared with a name and then the address changed. And then in the 1938 uh, book, I found a, a map in the, in the back of the phone book. And by looking at it, I, I looked at, I, I searched for his, the address of his business. He had a driving school. And I saw on the map that right across from it was the synagogue. And to me, that became a whole important part of my narrative because it was 38 during Reichskristallnacht, so that was when that map was from. So I knew that he must have inadvertently seen what, th even through his window, what happened, or at least the result of what had happened. And that's, to me, so exciting. I mean, to me, the most exciting part of working on the project was the research because people come alive in these old books and um, it really felt like paper graves that you know suddenly these people uh, rose from these pages and um, also a big part of my a big find in the archive was um, uh, my grandfather uh, lived in the American sector so um, everybody in the American sector after the war had to fill out a questionnaire of I think 114 questions um, answering to what they had done during the Nazi regime. And I found the original questionnaire that my fa grandfather filled out in his original handwriting. And uh, based on that, you were ranked into a category of, uh, there were five different categories, ranking from innocent or victim, victim under the regime to a uh, war criminal, basically. And his rank was somewhere in the middle. and he tried to appeal against it. And so I had this whole file, which was a conversation between him and the US government, mm -hmm. the original letters that he had written by hand and with his typewriter. And it was this narrative that unfolded to me because it was in chronological order. And I found out everything that my family never knew by just listening to him. I mean, it was really like um, as if he had talked to me finally. Um, so those were the main areas of research I engaged in. Well, it was actually my question, but you already answered it. If you discovered through your research, like, you know, family secrets or things, what family members did not know, and you already... Yeah. Um, I'm kind of thinking uh, something you mentioned a little bit earlier about political artwork. Um, just given the current climate um, in the United States, I feel like kind of talking about politics has suddenly become a lot more urgent. And I think for a lot of artists, there's a lot of wondering about how to tackle the issue of discussing politics in your artwork. And I feel like both of your artwork, um, it, it has like political themes, but you might not be overtly discussing your political beliefs in it. So I was wondering if I could just get your like thoughts about like being overtly political versus having more like subtext that you know you might slip in like what you think about that hmm. <laughs> no, it's um well my work is always very personal and i guess that the subtext is always my beliefs and and i i i couldn't i could not be political in my personal work i guess um yeah, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't do um, satire for a newspaper or anything like a like a um, caricature. You know, that's not what I do. But I do think that I show my beliefs in whatever I draw. Uh, I mean, it's great that you talk about this because there is a, a huge range, I think, of being a political artist, and I find it hard to. I think I like a lot of it, you know, some is more um, obviously political uh, than 
you know, I mean, I, I, I love a lot of the New Yorker covers, and um, I do also, though, believe that, um, in a way, everything is political. You know, every illustrator's work is political because it always says something about the society we live in. And as you say, we're not always aware of it, uh, but I think it always communicates something about that. And who we are is always informed by our country's history. So I think all of this flows into the work. Um, I, I'm a big fan of the personal narrative and of, of subtlety and um, because I think it gives us, I mean, Mouse was a great example for that, um, a very direct access to history or political issues because it's, uh, it, in a way, it's an act of, of empathy, you know, engaging with these people and these stories by drawing the people who experience them. It's a way of trying to, under, the act of drawing, for me, is a way of trying to understand them. Mm -hmm. And um, and so it's, it's like acting. It's, yeah, it's an act of empathy. And I think the more personal you get with that, the more accessible the story will be to the audience. But there's a big range of political work that I like. Um, I'm just wondering if you see an emergence of a new German identity, maybe that um, embraces Germans of Turkish descent or more recent refugees, or do you think that there's maybe just the beginnings of it? Um, so the question is if, if there are different German identities yeah, now, I'm or if you see maybe a, a German identity that's not so focused on post World War II, that's maybe more multicultural, more modern, embracing you know all aspects of German society. Well, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Yes, yes, of course. I mean, it's it's part of my it's part of my childhood, and I, but I do notice that it's very different for others, especially now living in a city like Hamburg. It's very different than from where I w where I was when I was a kid. Um, yes, it's uh, it changes the entire time, especially um, what I've noticed with. Um, kids that have um, like a Turkish background, they have a lot more kind of German pride than my generation. It's, that has changed a lot. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, of course, Germany has never been as diverse as, as America, but, um, you know, since the 50s when uh, Germany depended on foreign laborers because everything was destroyed, um, you know, we had a lot of um, Greek and Italian and Turkish immigrants. Um, so there has, even when we were going to school, we had, you know, a diverse student body, I would say. Um, Germany also was the country, along with Sweden, I think, who accepted the most immigrants in recent years. Mm -hmm. I think one million in a year, is that correct? Um, so I'm sure that is and will have a major impact. But what I find interesting is because I was asking myself the same question because um, a part of my research that also went into the book was um, trying to understand German identity in a context that was not related to the war. So what I did was I spoke to German Jewish communities who emigrated to, uh, <laughs> to New York um, during the war and tried to get a sense of what, um, what their understanding of German cultural identity is. I also went to Milwaukee and met with German communities there that were uh, more removed from the war when it happened or had emigrated before the war. Um, and then I also went back to Germany to see how it might have changed uh, w when I had left. And I went to a play that was put on in, in Berlin. Um, it was the, it was Brundibar, you know, that was written in Theresienstadt, I believe. Maurice Sendak did a great uh, stage set uh, adaptation with Tony Kushner here some years ago. And um, uh, the, the, uh, the actors were not only of entirely German origin, some of them were actually, I spoke after the performance, I spoke, and it was, a, sorry, it was a play performed by middle school children. And uh, one of the actresses, uh, her parents are Iranian, and she was, her parents were first generation immigrants to Germany. But she grew up in Germany as a German Iranian girl. And I asked her about the war and how she felt about it. And she felt like she had to be part of this play because she felt like as a German, she was, it was her, her responsibility to address the subject 
in the form of a play. So even as an Iranian, the daughter of an Iranian couple who had never been part of the war, she felt like it was her responsibility as a new German generation. And I, I was so impressed by that. On the other hand, we have the opposite you know, movement happening as it is all over Europe and in America. We have the Pegida movement, which is a right-wing movement and has a lot of followers all over Germany, both, both in East and West. And um, it's disturbing to see that some people st still don't really, under, you know, have not, uh, seem to have forgotten history so f quickly. Um, and when you go online, I mean, in the course of my research, I went, I ended up on a lot of dubious home, uh, you know, web pages, um, looking for <laughs> visual material and things like that. And um, it's shocking what comments in German you can find. I mean, things are said on certain web pages that I didn't even think any German would say mm -hmm. today. And you know, so that's why I think it's so important that we keep on talking and looking about, you know, looking at these images, talking about these issues and continue to do that uh, and reflect on how we can deal with these issues today. Uh, well, I guess, uh, I guess I'll ask the last question then. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, uh, being a fan of both of your works, it seems like there's an awful lot of humanity and humor that just naturally comes through. It's almost, almost to a form of, of release and seems to be highly highly stitched and ingrained in your your own identities your creative voice i wonder if you might be able to speak as to where that comes from because it seems rather rather important and and quite a quite a large through line and communication device in in the work that you got you both do oh. <laughs> i was hoping you you would go first <laughs> um you mean humor and uh Humanity. So yeah, I mean, al almost, almost as if it, almost as if it both were a vehicle and a, and a reveal at the same time in the in the subject matter and the images as you construct them, whether it's through narratives or the single, you know, single images and illustration. I mean, the humor part is is difficult because um, you know, with the subject of war and being in the perpetrator grandchild role, you know, you have to know when to use it and. Um, I mean, there's even an image uh, where I show the moment of my uncle's death and I pair it with, you know, because in Germany there's this expression which I think is used here too, but less uh, so, uh, uh, he fell in the war, meaning he died in the war. And I realized doing my research in that little village, talking to people that a lot of my family members died by falling in various different ways. One fell in the, 19, in the 1800s, one fell down some stairs and died. Another one fell from the beam of a, a barn and died. And uh, my grandfather fell of a tractor and died. And my uncle fell in the war. And so I made this grid of four different ways of falling to death. And um, you know, looking at it, I do wonder if it's a little distasteful <laughs> <laughs> because um, I'm ridiculing this, um, these moments of death, but uh, I think I put it in there because there were no family narratives to, to tell because in my uh, mater uh, paternal family, nobody ever talked about anything. There were no stories, not even stories not related to the war. Nobody had any stories to tell. And I'm feeling that lack of narrative and I realized how important it is to have a narrative and then going into this village it took me a while, you know, still by talking to people who knew my uncle and my family, I couldn't really construct a family narrative. And this was the first and only thing I could cling to was the realization that four people in my family had died by falling. And so it's more of an ironic statement on the fact, uh, on the lack of my knowledge of my family story. And that's why I thought it was justified to use uh, humor you know, as a way of communicating the narrative in that moment. But most of the time, I, I feel like I, I shouldn't use, you know, because, I mean, humor can really distract from the severity of a, of a moment. Um, and then humanity, um, or, yeah, that was the word, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, my mother was an overly, uh, is a very, very uh, empathetic person, and uh, that paired, you know, her, her feeling of empathy towards everything and everyone all the time throughout my childhood and then 
the, the feeling of guilt, collective guilt and shame I grew up with, I think that just made me very sensitive to other people's plight. And, um, but again, you know, the, the, the question for me is always, how do you communicate that in a narrative that's not sentimental? Um, and it's partly about the writing, so I always try to be very matter-of-fact with the writing because I feel like if you combine emotional writing with an emotional image, it's too much. So sometimes when the uh, writing is more emotional, I'm more reduced with the image and vice versa, and so that's, those are the questions I've been dealing with while working on the book. Well, in German we have this word Leidenschaft, passion, and it means kind of for me, it means kind of producing something while you're suffering, and uh, Leiden means suffering. Yeah, so it means um, yeah. Leiden is suffering and schafft passion, uh, passion of Christ. Yeah. yeah. Well, but and and actually, um, when I went to art school, people would come back after uh, a week of assignments that they had to draw something in class for. And they would be like, oh, this was so much fun, professor. Uh, 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 I really love doing this assignment. And I always sat there and I was like, I, uh, that was not, you know, I just, I just suffered the entire week <laughs> doing what I was doing. It was just not, that, that, that's not fun. It's like you have to suffer and do all this work and scratch and just, it's, um, and I, I guess the humor part always gets into this, you know, I always have to, I have to add a little bit of fun to the suffering or otherwise I wouldn't continue. Yep. I guess that's it. I mean, I don't really have an answer to it, but I like when, when the pictures, I mean, it's comparable maybe to your, uh, the text not being sentimental of the picture is. And if the picture looks really dark or kind of, little bit horror-like, then I have, I really like to have a context that's fun, just to have a contradiction. And also writing those memories about my grandmother that I've just been releasing, um, I also wanted to have all these little family things that are fun, that are strange but fun, mm -hmm. next to those really nice pictures. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Lena and Nora.